Amen. Amen. Beautifully sung. Thank you, choir. Well, here we are, the beginning of a new series, which I am so excited to be a part of. Fully Alive, that title of the series coming none other from the phrase quoted originally by St. Irenaeus, the second century patristic father who said, the glory of God is a human being who is fully alive. Well, in this series, a six-part series, we are going to be journeying through the book of Acts. So I encourage you all to read along with us in the book of Acts as part of your daily quiet time, remembering that 15 minutes a day in the word of God will change your life. To begin this sermon series, I wanted to tell a story. There was once a man who traveled all throughout Europe during what was to be the construction of many important buildings in that time. As he went to the day laborers who were making their hearts be known through their effort, he would ask them the simple question, what are you doing? One man was representative of many as he wiped the sweat from his brow, he said, Sir, I am doing nothing more than laying the bricks that I am told to put together, one on top of the other. This is my job, but it is not my joy. It is a means to an end, but that is all. But then he encountered another man. One who was working on that same building, in fact, and said, Sir, what are you doing? The same man, giving equal effort and still wiping sweat from his brow, also one who was in charge of being a brick mason, said, I, I, sir, am building a cathedral to the glory of God. Both with the same job, but with completely different interpretations for why they existed. What, I might ask, made the difference? What made the difference in one who said, I am just existing, and the other who said, I am fully alive? I want to contend to you today that the answer is true not only for them, but also us today, that it's our purpose that makes all the difference. What is your purpose today? Have you thought about purpose through the lens of Holy Scripture? If we follow the trail, it actually starts in the beginning when God made the heavens and the earth. Saving creation for last to be human beings and then giving them a purpose, which was to give them a passion and a fulfillment. Saying in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through 29, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful. And increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. In other words, my friends, the purpose of man in the garden was to be co-ruler of creation with God. That was our purpose. That was the original good before there was ever original sin. But then came the fall of man, and with it, the loss of his purpose. God pronouncing over man, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. In that moment, man lost his divine purpose. And because of it, it started forward a story as old as time in which people try to regain and find once again their purpose. In Holy Scripture, it can be summed up in as much 
kings and kingdoms, people vying for power, people vying for control, people, in so many words, trying to recapture their purpose. And it wasn't until a man named Jesus came who proclaimed himself to be the Son of God that he helped man regain his purpose, saying on the Sermon on the Mount, to those listening, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. What I ask is the purpose per Jesus for humanity to once again be light. And though it was still ambiguous at that point, Jesus made sure that we knew our purpose forevermore when he bought it at the precious price of his own blood, giving his very life on the cross, but then solidifying the deal as he walked free from the tomb. As our own Jennifer Gendrix told us, he interacted with his disciples in his resurrected body, causing them to believe, causing them to also rediscover their purpose. But as captured by the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells everyone what their purpose is to be now and forevermore, saying in chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In other words, that which would have been taken from us in the garden after the fall of man was reestablished to us. We were once again co-regents of creation through the kingdom of God as we go forward, subduing the world by baptizing it in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it was those disciples who finally received that purpose again and were put forward in motion in radical purpose that we find ourselves in today's scripture reading. You remember it from Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. Disciples who, to bum the phrase off of Rick Warren, were living purpose-driven lives. A few qualifiers here before I read this next excerpt. Since the resurrection of Jesus, they have encountered the resurrected Savior. They have seen him ascend to the heavens in Acts chapter 1. And then in Acts chapter 2, as they are in an upper room praying, they hear a mighty wind rushing through and then flames that are like tongues of fire appear above each and every head of the disciples gathered there. They set forward on the day of Pentecost preaching the gospel in many of the languages of the people gathered there. Those days, 3,000 people came to believe Christ Jesus was Lord and the church of Jesus Christ was launched. But such radical movements do not come without cost. For the Sanhedrin, the ruling governing body over the Jewish nation, took exception Not only to the fact that the disciples said the Sanhedrin was complicit in the death of Jesus, but moreover, they were pronouncing that very message in the temple courts where the Sanhedrin was within earshot. They arrest the disciples as a threat, but lo and behold, the disciples escape, returning to the very temple courts to profess again that Christ Jesus is Lord, And then the Sanhedrin brings them in to have a little stare-down competition. They believe that with the authority and the might they possess, they are going to be, in the words of the Godfather, able to make the disciples an offer they cannot refuse. Hush up about Jesus and how we killed him. 
and stop spreading lies and myths about how he resurrected from the dead. You'll do this if you know what's good for you. To which the disciples and Peter specifically reply in Acts chapter 5, verses 29 through 32. Peter and the other disciples replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. And this next part to be underlined in your Bible. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Paraphrase. We are fully alive in Jesus Christ, Sanhedrin, said Peter. We do not fear anything even death itself. But if we had to fear one thing, it would be not living into the fullness of the purpose we have within our hearts. And that purpose is to be witnesses. Now that word is very important for us because the purpose of the witness is to tell what they see and they know as truth. But the power of the witness is not in their singular voice alone. No, the power of the witness is when they have, likewise, other witnesses who were able to corroborate the story. Tell me one thing through one perspective, and I might believe you, but have two, three, four, or five people saying the exact same thing, and all of a sudden, it's a much more convincing case. Not only... Peter and the disciples say that ultimately corroborating this story is the living spirit of God called the Holy Spirit. And it testifies likewise to the things that Jesus did and who Jesus is even before the dawn of time. It is almost a triangle of witnesses. It's something that cannot be refuted. And in that moment... The Sanhedrin realizes that Peter and the gang aren't going to blink. So they go back to the inner chambers of that time and they begin to have a discussion. What shall we do with these men? I'm sure one of the options listed was to rub them out, but previous memory came to serve them that it didn't work too well for them when they did that very same thing to Jesus. After all, that's how this all got started in the first place. But then a teacher of the law, one who was named Gamaliel, said the following in verses 38 through 39 of chapter 5. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, Sanhedrin, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. The Sanhedrin is willing to allow this to go forward. They can't let the disciples go scot-free, mind you, so they have them severely flogged, a beating by large wooden rods, but they no less let them go to which the disciples leave those courts praising God that they had been counted worthy enough of suffering for the gospel and, of course, going right back to the temple courts to profess the name of the risen Savior once again. This is evidence that people in the book of Acts had found a purpose that was more powerful than anything they had ever before realized. Whether they had been fishermen or tax collectors or others, they before was laying bricks, no less doing good work and good name, but with no significant purpose. But then with the Holy Spirit and the corroboration of other witnesses as they professed what they had seen Jesus do and say, that they had seen the resurrected Christ and then themselves received the Holy Spirit 
They realize that we, together, are not just laying bricks. We, in fact, are building a cathedral to the glory of God. We are fully alive. But I might ask you the question, what does that mean now? After all, this is the postmodern age, the 21st century. There are bills to pay. We have modern science. We have technology that they, these disciples, never before dreamed. In fact, the opulence of this very room was something they could have never dreamt possible. What does that mean to our purpose? Write this down if you're taking notes. But purpose never changes with context. Your context is the 21st century postmodern people, but your purpose remains the same. You, my friends, and I are called to be a community of witnesses. Witnesses who likewise profess to the things that they have seen God do, the way they see the kingdom alive, and the way that they know that in serving in Jesus' names, they themselves become fully alive to the glory of God. The problem is, is that we as the 21st century of church have placated, we have dismissed our duty. We believe it's other people's job, perhaps that of the senior pastor alone. But I need to offer a corrective. It is in fact the same purpose for all of us. Not because pastor says so, but in fact because the word of the God declares it as much, and also with it the invitation that only through fulfilling this purpose can we become truly, fully alive again. So let me ask you some questions that I want you to answer, questions that will be formative to how you craft your witness to proclaim to other people. Likewise, write these questions down. How has Jesus blessed your life. How has Jesus blessed your life? I want you to answer that question in your quiet time. What does this church mean to you? Question two. Write that question down. Answer it and let the answer inform your witness. And lastly, question number three. Where are you serving God now and how does it bless your life? I believe that as you write these questions down, answer them for yourselves, it will transform your witness. It will set you in a course of action that you too, amongst a larger community, go forward and speak to what you know to be true about the living God. And not only you will have Sister Sally and Brother Tommy within earshot that say, Amen, brother. I saw that very same event, and it was just like you said it was. And, of course, all of us within our hearts and minds have the Holy Spirit ablaze that testifies with the truth that we ourselves cannot adequately describe because it is the very voice of the living God. Yes, our context is different. We are not in the first century. We are not in the book of Acts as was Peter and the apostles, but our purpose remains the same. Be witnesses. But as much as our context doesn't change our purpose, your purpose will transform your context. Now write that down. Your purpose will transform your context because I believe that in the words of Thoreau, there are in fact scores of humanity that are living their lives in quiet desperation. They wonder what more is out there? Why can't I feel fully alive? And the reason is, is because they have not discovered the purpose which God has in store for them. They are laying bricks, sweat on their brow, asking when will there be an end to this toil and labor. They do not attribute their life to something greater, like building a cathedral to the glory of God, but it does not 
have to stay that same for them or for you. For even within the church, there are those who are still asking, what's this really about? I don't feel different. I don't live differently. Why Jesus? Why does it matter? But, my friends, your purpose and being a witness will change your context, for it will no longer be just a job. It will no longer be just going to school, young people. It will no longer be just sports. It will no longer be just family. It will no longer be just marriage. And God forbid it to be true, but it will no longer be just church. We won't be living lives in which we say we just put one brick on top of another. Nothing to it. Boring. Next, please. Instead, as we live into the purpose of being witnesses for the risen Savior, everything, anything that we do is no longer just fill in the blank. It is building a cathedral to the glory of God. So I ask you, my friends, do you want to be fully alive? Do you want to live the life that is to the glory of God? Then it begins with your purpose here and now today. And if you are without purpose, I'm here to tell you there is no shame in admitting that you need to find a purpose. And I offer to each of you humbly but boldly that Jesus Christ is the answer for your life. That today your purpose can launch in which you are no longer laying bricks, but you are now transformed to building cathedrals to the glory of God. Your life will be different Trust me, all that it requires of you today is a step of faith to come and say, I need a savior. I need forgiveness for sin. I need transformation of your life. Jesus Christ is here today to say, yes, I freely give it to you. Likewise, for those who say, I need a broader body. I need a community of witnesses where I will be able to share my story, corroborate their story and mine, all while being undergirded by the Holy Spirit. This place, First Baptist Church of Carrollton, is that community. Come and join today. And lastly, if you just need to sing praises to God and pray from where you are seated today, in this our invocation prayer, I invite you to do so. Hymn number 493, Have Thine Own Way, Lord as we sing about the purpose that is to come in Christ Jesus. Will you join us and will you sing? <laughs>